Vat Adventures Corp is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is investigative reporter Spencer Fernando. You can find his articles at SpencerFernando.com. Welcome back to the show, Spencer. Good to be here. The NATO summit, how well did that turn out to be with Donald Trump in attendance and scolding everybody? Uh, it looked like it turned out fairly well in the end, as those things go. I mean, he just uh, seemed to declare victory at the end, saying that everyone's committed to increasing their defense spending quickly to 2%. It uh, doesn't seem like that's exactly the case. They've kind of reaffirmed that they're moving towards it, but not that quickly. But uh, he often does that. He'll say he wants something, and then whether he gets it or not, he kind of claims victory anyway to make it look like he's doing well. So if that's the mood he's in, then I guess it could have been worse. How do you think he's going to do with his uh, meeting up with the Queen? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that'll go fine. The Queen doesn't really get too politically involved anyway, so I don't think there'll be much there. The thing about Trump is he used to joke on the campaign trail that he could be very presidential when he wanted to, uh, and then he would just go read from a teleprompter in a really boring voice. And it does seem that he actually can. Like when he did the uh, uh, announcement of the Supreme Court nominee, uh, Kavanaugh, there, I think it was, he, he was fairly presidential there, so... It seems like in certain moments he's able to, you know, kind of turn off the uh, the more aggressive persona and act like a more traditional politician. He just doesn't choose to do it too often. And really, he he was voted in to be a different kind of politician. He doesn't act that way in most cases. Is that an advantage or disadvantage? I think it's an advantage. I mean, he, I mean, the election in the states was close, but he won because I think he was seen as the kind of find change. And a lot of people in the country weren't happy with the way things are going. Clinton was seen either as just continuing what Obama was doing or as just uh, continuing the Clinton dynasty, so she wasn't seen as changing anything. How's that going to play out, you think, with NAFTA and the tariff wars against uh, Canada, who you would arguably say has been the U.S.'s closest ally for 150 years? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, a lot of people are kind of making the mistake thinking that Trump isn't really serious about the, all the trade stuff. But if you look back, I mean, he's changed political parties a bunch of times. I mean, other people have. I have too myself, so I'm not going to actually hold that against him. But he's changed a lot of his views over time, except for his views on trade. He was on Oprah in the 90s, even. You know, the 80s or 90s, I think, or early 90s or something. And he was talking about how the U.S. was being screwed over by countries on trade deals. So that's something he's really believed in for a long time, and I don't think it's going to go away. So I think countries are going to have to... You know, adapt to the fact that that's what he's thinking. Uh, some countries, Canada will have to probably diversify and also strengthen our own domestic economy. You know, if we're going to have trade trouble with the states, breaking down our provincial trade barriers would be a way to mitigate against the damage that could cause. Uh, but yeah, I think people assuming that it's just going to go away or he's pretending or just talking, you know, and he's pretty serious about changing the way trade is done. Would his tariffs be considered a failure if he has to subsidize people who are being hurt by countervailing duties? Uh, I guess it depends on people's perspective. From like a pure free market perspective, that would be seen as a failure. Uh, but Trump's definitely more of an economic nationalist, so I think if, he, if it came to the point where they were subsidizing companies to boost manufacturing production in the States, I don't think he would really see that as a bad thing. You know, he wants more tangible goods being produced, or he wants more factories opening up. And he doesn't seem to care too much about budget deficits, so I, I don't think he would be too uh, troubled by that. The Republicans in Congress, most of who are much more free market oriented, they would probably have a problem with that. So it'd be interesting to see uh, what kind of tension there would be there. Was Trump correct to say that most of the countries in NATO are not pulling their own weight or contributing what they promised to? Well, yeah, from a factual perspective, it is that is correct. Uh, the U.S. spends, I think, 3.6% of their GDP on their military, and they have the biggest GDP in the world, so that's why their military is the, the biggest in terms of spending in the world. Uh, other countries spend far less. Uh, Germany spends 1.2 or 1.3. Canada is about 1.3. 
um, maybe 1.2, and that's after the government included a bunch of different things in defense spending to boost the number. It was about 0.9 before. So, and very few countries, I think, Estonia, Greece, um, Britain. I think they all meet the uh, the NATO standards for two percent, maybe one or two others. Uh, Poland's very close. I mean, in Greece's case, I mean that's because their economy collapsed. So if your GDP gets cut by a third, then all of a sudden your defense spending as a percent of GDP looks bigger. But uh, yeah, so it is true. And you know, it's what's kind of ironic is that all the countries, even Canada and Germany, they talk about how afraid they are of Russia, and then they don't spend much in their military. I mean, Germany has a far bigger economy than Russia in terms of GDP. If Germany spent even three or four percent of their military, I mean, they could have a military equivalent to that of Russia. I mean, whether we want the uh, Germany and Russia competing against each other militarily again is another question, but they can, on the one hand, act so afraid of Russia, but then not increase their defense spending. Is the U.S. correct to complain about Germany uh, getting more natural gas and oil from Russia from a giant pipeline? I think so. It is pretty hypocritical on Germany's part because they, I mean, they shut down much of their coal industry. Uh, they put a bunch of regulations that kind of strangled their ability to produce energy. And then they bought a bunch of, they're buying a bunch of gas from Russia. So they send billions of dollars to Russia every year. Um, and they make themselves dependent on Russia. I mean, Russia could turn off the, the taps. Obviously, Russia would lose money, but Germany would lose, you know, the ability to heat a lot of their country. So that'd be a serious problem. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it's very hypocritical to, on the one hand, say, you know, we want the U.S. to spend their money defending Germany because the U.S. has about 30-something thousand troops in Germany, but also we're going to buy a bunch of energy from Russia and make ourselves beholden to Russia in that way and not spend much of our military. So I, I could see why the U.S. is upset about that. I mean, it's not popular to agree with something Donald Trump says necessarily, but in this case, I think he does make a good point. Where would Germany get its oil and gas if they didn't get it from Russia? Well, they could get it from the United States. Uh, that's one option. Uh, that's what the U.S. wants. There's obviously a you know financial and political component to what Trump is saying too. Uh, and they could also they could boost their own domestic production of energy. I mean, one reason they need more oil and gas or more gas from Russia is because they really weaken their coal industry, which is heating a lot of the country. So you know, I think if they got they want to be more truly independent, then they should boost their own energy production. We'll have more with Spencer Fernando right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp., RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alva Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Spencer Fernando. Spencer, do you make much out of this latest controversy saying that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau groped somebody years and years ago? Well, you know, I think, you know, I've written a fair amount about it, and every time I write about it, I, I say that I think the real controversy is his hypocrisy. You know, if he was, if he was, you know, someone who had, um, you know, not branded himself as, you know, the biggest feminist of all time, if he hadn't kicked other people out of his party for allegations, you know, some cases unsubstantiated, and if he hadn't, uh, you know, when uh, Patrick Brown was in trouble, Trudeau went out and said, oh, we have to believe all allegations, this is unacceptable, zero tolerance. If he hadn't done those things, then I don't think people would really care that much about the story. I mean, you know, it's, it sounds like he did not great, who knows, different people say different things. But I think people would say, you know, it's a long time ago, people change, people, uh, you know, learn, uh, not a big deal. The issue is that he's held other people to a standard that he seems unwilling to apply to himself. So every other case was zero tolerance, and then when it comes to him, oh, all of a sudden it's complicated. So I really think the hypocrisy is the issue. Does Parliament need a formal process to handle this, these kind of complaints? You know, that's tough because there's, I mean, there's a legal system, uh, either for you know, criminal charges uh, or there's, uh, you know, civil uh, suits and everything. Um, 
the thing if you do it through parliament, uh, there's always the concern that it gets politicized, right? Which is, you know, does the party in power trying to shift the process to let their own people get off the hook or to punish people in other parties? I think, you know, there is a legal system for a reason. I mean, and um, political parties can do what they want. They can kick people out if they want to. And that's their choice. But uh, I think making it political and putting it within parliament, I, I'd be pretty concerned about that. I mean, politicians have shown that they'll use any advantage they can to win elections. And especially in an era where accusations get thrown around, I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't trust uh, you know, parliament to handle those things. Can you have an independent committee look after these things? I mean, you could technically, but I, I really don't think there's any such thing as an independent committee in politics. I mean, it's a nice word, it's a nice name, but you know, the committee's still staffed with MPs, and they're all part of it. So. No, but I was thinking of a, a panel, perhaps, of uh, three retired judges. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that could be possible. Um, I, I don't know, I, I just think putting it through the political system, putting it through parliament is probably a mistake. Spencer, Ontario has a new government under Doug Ford. He seems to be kind of a an individual person as well who likes to do things his own way one of his first moves uh, getting rid of the the cap and trade carbon system in ontario is he going to be a real reformer and open some eyes i think so you know i think he's doing a great job so far he's kept his promises uh, you know he's almost every day seems to announce a new promise he's kept and this is somewhat the easy part because you're you're keeping the promises that you can do through you know one piece of legislation, uh, different things like you know getting to a balanced budget or growing the economy. That's going to take more time. But you know I think a lot of uh, politicians could learn from what he's doing. Is you make promises during the campaign, I think he's done a good job. Do you think other politicians in Canada are are watching him closely to see how successful or unsuccessful he is? I think so. You know, he definitely campaigned in a, in a way that was a lot different than, uh, you know, I think past conservatives. You know, he campaigned against the elites, whereas often, especially in Ontario, the conservative party there had been, or the, the PC party there had been, uh, more of an elite party. And he was very successful. I mean, it's very interesting. He, um, you know, when he first decided to run for the leadership of the party, uh, much of the media was saying how he was going to get crushed, how he could never win, he had no chance. But he won a huge majority, whereas the other candidates in the past, Tim Hudak and John Tory, you know, the media covered them a lot differently in some cases, and they got crushed. So I think, you know, he's really revealed that there's a, in many cases, there's a big difference between what much of the media thinks believe, and uh, I was definitely exposed. Well, one of the unique things he did, he did not have a media bus for all the mainstream media right along behind his bus on the campaign trail. Instead, he had his own television reporters and sent out his own reports via social media. Mm -hmm. Is that going to change the way other politicians do their campaigns? I think so. It's, you know, it's the feature of campaigning. I mean, the media used to be an intermediary because they had the, the technology uh, to get, I mean, everyone's watching TV or listening to the radio or reading the newspaper, and the media controlled the transmission of all those things. Now, you just need a phone and you can get your message out to people. And that's what he did, and I think it worked pretty well. And there's often is, I think, an anti-conservative bias in much of the media. And, you know, going right to the people with a message is a way to get around that. We'll have more with Spencer Fernando right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Spencer Fernando. Spencer, the Bank of Canada hiked its uh, trend-setting rate uh, recently. How much of an impact is that going to have on business and on people who want to own their own home? Well, I think it's going to be tough for a lot of people. Uh, just before the hike a few days ago, uh, Myers Norris Penny, I think, did a survey, and it was 28% of people said that higher interest rates would risk putting them into bankruptcy, and then another 40 or something percent said uh, it would be it would cause them trouble paying their bills. 
I mean, Canada has some of the highest debt in the world uh, on a household basis. So, you know, any increased interest rates is, is tough. The main way is the Bank of Canada is trapped because on the one hand, if you leave interest rates low for too long, then often more debt gets accumulated. But if you increase them, then the people who have a lot of debt struggle. I've said many times one of the solutions to that would be I think the government should look at cutting taxes, especially for low-income, middle-income people. You know, a big tax cut, uh, getting rid of a lot of regulations would help boost the economy, create growth, put more money in people's pockets, and that would be a way to, uh, to mitigate the, the impact of rising interest rates. But since the government's going in the opposite direction, so we're going to have taxes and regulations increasing at the same time interest rates are increasing, and I don't think that's going to end too well. Can Canada remain competitive with the U.S. with uh, increasing carbon taxes? I don't think so. I mean, we're already seeing billions in investment leave, a lot of it for the U.S., and especially with all the trade uncertainty. I mean, people, that's going to make people more likely to go to the biggest economy in North America, which is the U.S. And, uh, yeah, Canada doesn't seem to have a policy to compete. We're just, you know, tying our own hands behind our back. Going on to another topic, gun violence in Toronto. Is it out of hand, and is, and is there any way to get a handle on it? Yeah, it's definitely gone up quite a lot. They seem to have these periodic, uh, you know, it goes down for a bit, then goes up. But this has been pretty bad so far. And, you know, I can't help but think there's probably a link between, you know, a lot of the politically correct uh, changes to policing practices, uh, you know, carding, the end of carding, things like that, and uh, then an increase in violence. I mean, it's always tough. For police to, you know, get a handle on gangs, you actually have to catch people doing something or catch them with an illegal uh, gun or drugs. And carding was a way to do that. And there were people who felt it was, uh, you know, uh, prejudiced or something. But hey, there's, there's, uh, seems to be a correlation between kind of a softer policing methods and an increase in crime. Well, Greater Vancouver also has a, a problem with, uh, it seems we have a gang-related shooting every second day. The Vancouver anti-gang squad seemed to get kind of a handle on it because they went to all the places where the gangsters like to hang out. And, of course, maybe they didn't card them, but they spent a lot of time talking to them and their girlfriends and making them feel uncomfortable. But it seems to me outside of Vancouver, in the greater Vancouver area, they don't have the number of police to do stuff like that, and that's where the violence is happening. Is that the same case in Toronto where outlying police forces don't have enough people to actually put feet on the ground and look after these kind of things? Well, yeah, it seems certain parts of the city, you know, poor areas of the city especially are having a big problem. And some of it's even spilled over into downtown. And I think it's, you know, there's just not enough uh, police officers, not enough spending on police. I mean, a lot of these cities, Vancouver, Toronto, they've grown and they are growing very rapidly in population. And I don't think the number of police has always kept up. And, uh, you know, it also shows, you know, they talk about gun laws. I mean, Canada's got very strict gun laws when it comes to uh, handguns. And yet it seems all these gangs are able to get their hands on all the guns they want, so... I see why people in rural Canada get upset when a whole bunch of new regulations come in because of gun crime happening in cities, and all of a sudden, you know, people in rural Canada have a whole bunch of new restrictions. I think the government needs to focus not so much on guns, but on the fact that uh, gangs are clearly a problem, or the gangs are growing, and there needs to be more spending and resources to deal with it. Yeah, I'm just thinking in the Lower Mainland, in Vancouver, they have about 1,400 police officers. In Surrey, the second largest city in British Columbia, it's almost the same size as Vancouver. They only have 700 RCMP officers. If you're going to be fighting crime with half the number of people in an area, I think that's three times bigger, does the city really have to spend more money on policing and more police officers? Yeah, I think they do. I mean, a lot of cities have very big bureaucracies. Uh, you know, if you cut that, you have more money to spend on police and different things, so you have to make some changes. And I think in some cases there does need to be a tougher policing approach. I mean, uh, you know, it's nice to obviously respond to concerns by some of the special interest groups, but you know, similar to what you saw in the States, I mean, a lot of the really the left-wing groups, there's a bad thing happening there, but there's also been a huge increase in crime in some cities where police were heavily criticized. So, you know, police obviously need to be accountable. Uh, you know, they have the power to use force. That always needs to be watched carefully. But when we get too far into condemning the police and, you know, attacking them for every, every little thing that goes wrong, you know, crime seems to go up. So, you know, we still need to have respect for police, and I think we need more of them. Spencer, how do you think uh, President Trump's visit with Vladimir Putin is going to go, and what will they talk about? Well, it's going to be interesting. I mean, he's, Trump's facing a lot of pressure to bring up certain issues with Putin. Uh, there's kind of an interesting dichotomy, though. Trump has been very nice in the way he talks to him. He has still kept sanctions on Russia, and Russia's not happy about increased U.S. military spending. So, 
You know, I mean, it's it's different. There's the actions of the government and the tone from uh, Trump, which has been different. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, Trump, I think he looks at it somewhat similar to the way he looks at North Korea. He tries to create a good personal relationship with the leader and then hope the country's relationship will change because of that. And I think everyone's waiting to see if that works. Do you think Putin does have something secret on Trump that he could blackmail him with? I doubt it. I mean, that sounds, I know people like talking about that. It's kind of a salacious thing, but I don't think that's the case. Um, you know, I think, if anything, there's some business ties Trump had in Russia. And he tried to do more in Russia, but didn't seem to be able to get much done there. But yeah, in terms of the, the more salacious stuff, I don't think that's the case. I think, and if you look at it, Trump respects leaders that are, for better or worse, seen as strong. You know, he said good things about the guy in the Philippines. I think he said good things about the leader in Turkey. I said good things even about Xi Jinping in China. Uh, you know, says good things about uh, Putin. And those are all leaders who are seen as, uh, you know, very uh, strong, in some cases dictators. Um, some Democrats, the guy in the Philippines is democratically elected. But they're all people who are seen as strong, tough leaders, and I think that's what Trump admires. And so it's not a surprise he would... Uh, like Putin for that reason. Do you think, well, the thing is, Putin and Trump have known each other for a long time. Some people have also suggested perhaps he wants closer relations with Russia because he wants to build the world's tallest building in Moscow. Yeah, maybe. I mean, he tried building the world's tallest building in Manhattan and that didn't work out. So maybe he'll try it in Moscow, but I don't know. I think, you know, there's, you know, I think a lot of the, the Trump Russia stuff is, you know, Nobody thought Trump won. Some people, but very few people thought Trump was going to win. I mean, that can be pretty psychologically shocking when, you know, prediction goes so wrong for people. You know, I think it's just, uh, there's a lot of conspiracies being thrown around, but I don't think any of the more salacious stuff is what's going on. Spencer, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, no problem. My guest has been investigative reporter Spencer Fernando. You can read his articles at spencerfernando.com. You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is TalkDigitalNetwork. Questions for the show or our guests can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.